Well, this morning, as we are studying the Word of God, we are going to offer the Lord our attention. We're going to offer Him our praise. We're going to give to Him our worship because we, we want the desire of our hearts to be that, that, that we are in sync with him, that we are submitting not just, um, not just this moment, but we're submitting every moment unto the Lord, that we're learning how to do that, that we're learning how to honor him even when it is not easy, that we are learning how to follow him so that, that our actions to whatever comes our way that our actions are always one that reflect Christ, that we are reflecting Christ to those around us so that we may walk, so that we may walk in his favor. Think about that. So that we may walk in his favor. What does it look like, regardless of the circumstances, to walk in God's favor. Now, one might assume that if we're walking in God's favor, that we're, we're receiving his blessings, that it's going to look like prosperity, that it's going to look like wealth, that, that if we are in God's favor, that we are going to have popularity. Read about the prophets, because I'm telling you, it didn't look that way. Some people think that if if we are receiving God's favor, that there will be authority, that there will be this this wealth of respect, that, that there will be worldly gains, or that there will be health. If you were here last week, you heard a message that was quite contrary to what the world um, might assume is the favor of God. If you missed that, I I really want you to jump online and, 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 and catch that message. Because what we heard was through great trial, through great pain, through great hardship, that God's favor was recognized. That, that the hand and the blessing of God was upon this man, not because it was easy, but because it was difficult and God worked through it to give him a message to share. Truth is sometimes hard to handle. Blessings and favor and, and all of these things that we assume to look in one way, what we are finding might actually look, look like something that none of us would ever invite into our lives. And yet God uses everything. I want you to hear that. I want you to believe that. I want you to know that. I want you to own the truth that when we are a reflection of Christ and he's working in our lives, that there isn't anything that he cannot use that cannot be turned into his favor. This week, if you've been listening to the news at all, even for a brief moment, what you know is that currently uh, in Israel, that that place where God's favor, that place where, where the blessings of God have played out for history, for, 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 for thousands of years, this place of miracles, This place where where God has done miraculous and amazing things. This history of God's favor. They are under siege. They they, they have become a, a war zone. Death and destruction and pain. I heard, I heard one report that that a baby's head was cut off as they killed the entire family. Death, destruction, hardship. We would be hard-pressed for us to understand what's happening there. In this place that has been labeled as a place where mighty blessings and honor have been flowing. And yet atrocities are spilling out. Brutality, evilness, sinfulness, murder. But this is what I know. Even though I don't understand that, I can't explain it, and I'm not even going to try. What I know 
is that the Lord hears the prayers of the faithful, period. And what I know is that he will not depart from those who are calling upon him, even in these types of events where we do not understand, where some might even be saying, so where is your God? How is it that this could happen, these atrocities? How could these things be happening if there is a God? A God who knows everything. A God who is omnipresent. A God who is all-powerful. If there is that kind of God, how can this be happening? And I cannot answer that question. But what I know, that I know, that I know, that without question... Without a doubt, he is God. And he loves his people. And we will not always be able to explain or understand the evilness that is around us. And as long as we are in this world, there will be evil people doing evil things. And we can't change that. I wish we could. But as long as we are here, we cannot. And another thing that I do know, which makes our relationship with him all the more precious, is that he will never force anyone to yield to his will, no matter the circumstance. And that can be hard. That can be hard to try to experience or live through or even understand. But he will not force those people who are choosing evilness, he will not force them to choose him. He will not force them to love him. He will not force them to obey him, no matter the circumstances. So when we do choose him, when we do respond, we know that that relationship it is strong, it is pure, it is true. It is good. It is also necessary in this world. So the title of this message is uh, When Bad Blood Separates Brothers. And that's exactly what's happening in the Middle East. But here's the thing I want you to know. This message, it was planned weeks in advance. This message was planned Long before we knew that this week was going to be happening in Israel, that the, the, the things of, of wickedness and hatred, that the religious jealousy was going to be boiling over, rearing its ugly head, we had no clue when this message was planned that that's what was going to be taking place in our world. But here's the thing. Our God knew and he placed this on our agenda for such a time as this to help us understand what's happening in our world, even though we cannot explain it. He is offering us some history here so that we can see what has been happening in our world. Isaiah 55, 7 and 9 says, And let the wicked change their ways, and banish the very thought of doing wrong. Let them turn to the Lord that he may have mercy upon them. If you want the mercy, if you want the grace, if you want the forgiveness, if you want the love of the Lord, it's right here. You have to turn to him. Yes, turn to our God, for he will forgive generously. Understanding what his forgiveness looks like in a world filled with evilness is one of the th things that we need to cling to right now. Verse 8 also helps us in, in a time like this. It says, and my thoughts are nothing like your thoughts says the Lord, and my ways are far beyond anything that you could ever imagine. 
For just as the heavens are higher than the earth, so my ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. This is why there will always be things that we do not understand. Don't for one minute think because you don't understand something that that means you are weak. When we don't understand something, when we say, Lord, help me in this moment of confusion. Help me, Lord, because I do not have a grasp on what is happening. I do not understand. When we are asking God for clarification, it is not a lack of faith. Not at all. Contrary to the point. When we are saying, Lord God, I need your strength right now because, because I, I need some clarification. I can't understand this. I can't grasp this. Your ways are far, far from my ways. I need some clarification. It's not a lack of faith. It is the fact that, that we are saying in our weakness, Lord, we need your strength. In our weakness, we, we need your help. It's okay to say that. Owning our human limitations. Owning our weaknesses. In regard to our capability of understanding evilness in our world does not make us weak. It makes us hungry for the truth. It makes us chase after God with everything in our being. It makes us dependent upon God. My friends, God is never intimidated. He is never angered when his people say, I do not understand. It is not a lack of faith. I do not understand, says, in my human weakness, Father, give me your strength. And so the study this week, and I really, really, if I've ever, ever, ever wanted you to use your study notes, it's this week, especially with what's going on in our world. We need this foundation found in God's word. We are studying these two brothers. They are twins, Esau and Jacob. And uh, as we look at what happened with these, these two brothers, these two brothers would have been far better off if they had gone to God and said, I do not understand the situation you have put us in. I do not understand, Lord God, why there is this rivalry between us. I do not understand. These brothers would have been far better off if they would have went to God with what they did not understand instead of responding to one another out of jealousy and out of rivalry that turned into anger and hatred and a desire to kill one another. It is so okay to say, God, I do not understand the situation you have put me in. Let's get in the habit of doing that instead of responding upon our emotions. So what happens with these boys is there's this jealousy that begins very early that, that uh, takes a hold of them in the form of sibling rivalry. Hey, my friends, there's a reason uh, that, that jealousy, jealousy is, is listed in the Big Ten. And I'm not talking about, I know it's football season, and I'm not talking about that Big Ten. The Big Ten that I'm talking about is the Ten Commandments. Jealousy is listed there. Um, we are to have uh, no other God before God Almighty. None. We are not to make for ourselves graven images, idols of any kind. We are not to take the Lord's name in vain. We're not to misuse his name. We are to honor the Sabbath. We are to remember this day of rest. My friends, we live in a busy world. We need a day of rest. Are you honoring the Lord with the Sabbath? Uh, honor your mother and father. Do not kill. Do not commit adultery. Do not lie. Do not steal. Do not covet. Which means you are not to allow this, this, this envy and jealousy. I want what I don't have. And I see that they've got something. And I want what they've got. We're not to allow that to grow within our heart. And when we do, you cry out to God and say, I don't understand why I'm feeling this way, God. But I surrender it to you. Get in the habit of saying, I don't understand what's going on. It's okay. It's okay. You know, when we're children, children, this is a normal experience for children to be jealous. 
It's a, it's a normal experience for children to want what they don't have. Uh, I see that this person has, has this doll and, or this car, and children do that. But when we become adults, we are to put childish ways come on, behind us. We are to put childish ways behind us. We are not to behave with jealousy and envy and bitterness as adults. A few years ago, Mike and I were on vacation, and we were on an airplane, and I was doing what everybody else does. You can say, you don't do this, but when you're on an airplane, there's nothing to do except stare at everybody else. (laughs) So I was staring at the people next to us and pretending that I wasn't. And it was a mother, and I was, I was kind of enamored because she was traveling alone with two small boys. And so as I watched this mother, I began to feel a little uneasy about her parenting skills. She reached in her bag, and she had a bag, a bag of fruit shoes. She has two boys. And she offers the bag, not to split the bag, not to share the bag, But she offers the bag of fruit shoes to the boy that looks to be the older child. He wrinkles up his nose and he looks real hateful at her. And he goes, I don't even like those. I don't want those. Okay. Then she says to the smaller child, this is the last pack. Are you kidding me? Are you kidding me? You just offered it to the other child. And now this child knows you didn't have another one. So you weren't going to give it to him. He wasn't going to get any. It's the last pack. Do you want it? And before he could even respond, the older child snatches it out of his mom's hand. Forget it. I want it after all. He no more wanted those fruit shoes than the man in the moon. He didn't even eat them. He wanted them up in his little grimy hand just so, just so his younger brother couldn't have them. And the poor little guy was dejected. He kind of whimpered a little bit, but you could tell this was something this child was used to. Oh, I wanted to shake that woman. I wanted to tell her, do you know what you're doing? Are you crazy? Unless that other child's a diabetic and needed some sugar, what you just did was wrong. It causes jealousy. Favoritism will always cause jealousy. And jealousy, jealousy will always cause us to behave poorly. Jealousy caused that little boy to snatch up those fruit shoes and then hold them the entire flight so that his brother could not have them. Jealousy is a sin. Always is a sin. And it's one of those sins, that behavior, that we learn to master at a very young age. And we learn to master it quickly, and we become very good at it. We are very good at fostering jealousy. And we grow into this as adults. We're all born with this propensity. We're all born with the ability to sin and what we do with that ability is very important sin is is like mold it'll grow on just about anything and once it starts growing it multiplies rapidly and it can be hard to let go of hard to clear away So we don't want it to begin growing at all. We want to nip this very quickly when we see it in ourselves. But we certainly don't want to foster it in other people as they watch our life. Well, if they can behave that way, then so can I. Jealousy will bring destruction. It will. And Not all jealousy, not all jealousy begins to grow on its own. 
It begins to grow because it's fostered. And often it's fostered from the behavior of parents. Parents, when we show favoritism over one child or another, it will cause major issues of sin. Case in point, Esau and Jacob. These twins were born to Isaac and Rebekah, and they learned how to be jealous people, not because they had a propensity or an ability, but because they saw this favoritism uh, uh, displayed from their parents from the very get-go. See, the thing is, before these children were even, uh, uh, before these children even took their first breath, before these babies were even born, They were struggling with one another in their mother's womb. And she asks the Lord, what's going on with these boys, these babies? She doesn't know they're boys at that point. These babies. And the Lord instructs her that inside of your belly, growing these babies are going to be two separate nations. I want you to hear this. I want you to hear when we call out to God, I don't understand what's happening. God will give us instruction. God will guide us. God will offer us the help that we are asking for. But once he does, what do you do with it? Because I'm going to tell you, he gives these parents instruction. He gives these parents information that they need and they don't heed the warning. In your womb are two separate nations And they shall be rivals. And the Lord tells them that the younger will be the master over the older. They have this information. So from the time these boys were born, they should have been fostering an explanation to them. They should have said the younger one is going to be stronger. This is God's will. We don't understand it. We can't explain it. But let's embrace it. Let's figure out how to live under this plan that God has given us, saying that you're both going to become mighty nations. What are we going to do with this? Let's talk about it. Let's try to figure it out. Let's let's understand that the nations will be rivals. My friends, there's a huge difference between the word rival and the word hate. Hatred. I looked this up in the Hebrew. This is a rival. It means that there's always going to be some tension, but it doesn't mean that they have to hate each other, that they have to try to destroy each other, that they have a desire to kill one another. And I thought about rivalry, that word rivalry. Lincoln and, and Jasper, there's always a rivalry, always will be. But that doesn't mean that we are going to take torches and axes and we're going to go to Jasper and we're going to try to destroy and kill those people. That's not what it means. It means we learn to live with the rivalry. But not that we try to destroy and kill one another. There's a huge difference between hatred and rivalry. And the Lord gave the instruction. Here is what you have. Now, what are you going to do with it? How are you going to rear these children? And do you know what Isaac and Rebecca chose to do? They chose to play favorites. Favoritism never, ever, ever ends up successful. As you go through all of the scriptures, there's not a single story, not a single circumstance, not an event where favoritism, especially where a parent was favoring one child over another, where it ends well. It doesn't. Genesis 25, 23 reads, And the Lord told her, The sons in your womb will become two nations. From the very beginning of time, the two nations will be rivals. One nation will be stronger than the other, and your older son will serve the younger son. That wasn't normal. It would have taken a lot of explanation. It would have taken a lot of tenderness with these young boys, teaching them before they are men who want to kill each other. But that didn't happen. Skip to verse 27. As the boys grew up, Esau, this is the firstborn, Esau became a skillful hunter. He was an outdoorsman. 
But Jacob, he was quiet-tempered, and he preferred staying at home. So these boys are drastically different drastically different. Isaac, this is the father of the boys, he loved Esau because he enjoyed eating the wild game that Esau brought home. But Rebecca, she loved Jacob. I can't imagine this. I can't imagine choosing to love one child and reject another. I know there are times when loving a child can be difficult. There are times when it feels like one child needs a little more of our attention than another. But that's not the kind of favoritism that we are talking about here. The kind of favoritism that's displayed where one parent says, I love you, I don't love you. And another parent says, but I love you, but I don't love you. Favoritism is always a recipe. Hear me. It is always a recipe for envy and anger and hatred, and of course, jealousy. Favoritism is one of those things that I've tried to guard against, especially as I raised our children. We raised, Mike and I raised our children. So imagine my dismay the other evening when I heard my grandchildren having this big old discussion about who was Grammy's favorite and I'm like, whoa, 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 hold the phone, kids. No, 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 no. Grammy doesn't have a favorite. Yeah, you do. No, I don't. Yeah, you do. Why would you say such a thing? Well, because Coco told us. Coco happens to be the oldest granddaughter. Coco decided she would take the designation for herself. So she told all the others, hey, just so you know, I'm Grammy's favorite. Always will be first girl. She always wanted a girl. I'm it. I'm the favorite. I was a little relieved to tell you the truth because I thought, had I been doing something that caused these grandchildren to see favoritism in me? We love them. We try to do our best. There are periods in time when one child does need more of our attention. That's normal. But when it's offered in a healthy manner, the children can see that. And they recognize that when they need a little extra attention, when they need a little extra love, you've got it for them also. That it's not something that you only are offering to one child. Psycholo a psychologist, uh, Ellen Weber Libby, is the author of the book, The Favorite Child. If in your family there has been a struggle with a favorite child, or maybe you grew up recognizing that you were the non-favored child, or maybe you were the favored child, this is a book, it's a good read. It, there's a lot of explanation in there that helps us understand why parents do what parents do. But the important part of all of her study is that um, when we offer preferential treatment to one child, it is detrimental to the health of that child. Their emotional health can be destroyed when they realize they are not the favored one. That made sense to me. It made total sense to me. I could totally buy that. I could totally buy if a child was the non-favorite child that it would be very unhealthy for their spiritual, their emotional, even their physical health. But then in the study, do you know what it also found? When there is a favored child in the household, it is not just unhealthy for the favored, uh, unfavored child, it's unhealthy for the favored child. The favored child develops behaviors and mannerisms and all, all kinds of behaviors that are not good. They are selfish. They are self-centered. They are unfair. It is unhealthy either way. Very important to know. Isaac and Rebecca obviously did not read the study. They did not read the study because their favoritism led to their boys growing up to hate one another, to have animosity for one another, and it caught 
caused this huge riff and separation in their family. Open a Bible. We're going to turn to page 28. We're looking at Genesis chapter 33. And at this point, uh, these young men are no longer young men. They are now adults and they've lived the bulk of their life decades. They have lived decades apart from one another totally, totally separated. They have not seen each other. They've not heard from one another. They've not talked to one another. They don't know what's going on in each other's life. Decades they have been apart. And they are apart for good reason. They are apart because decades earlier when their father Isaac was lying on his deathbed, Jacob deceives his father. This would not have been necessary. This deception would not have been necessary had they already talked through the boys and explained that the blessing that God desired was for the younger child, but no, it didn't happen that way. And so the younger child decides he's going to lie to his father, lie to his brother. And this is exactly what he does. He pretends to be Esau. Jacob pretends to be Esau convinces his father that he is Esau, and he receives the blessing from his father. When Esau finds out what Jacob has done, he's furious. No, he's beyond furious. Because what he realizes is this blessing was that that Jacob would be the master, not only over him, but over all of their brothers, they, they've got, they've got this, this, this litany. There are 12 of these brothers. Well, at this point, 11. That there will be 12 of these brothers. And that, that Jacob will rule over them. That's the part of the blessing. That, that the abundance of wine and grain and, and all of the goodness that this father has to offer, that it will pass over Esau. He understands that. There's nothing left for Esau. Once this has been given to Jacob... It cannot be retracted, and there's nothing left for Esau. It's all been handed over to Jacob in a lie. And Esau flies into a rage, and he swears that he will kill Jacob. And he probably would have. But Rebecca, she, she catches wind of what is about to happen, that Esau is going to kill, and he's plotting to kill Jacob. And so, so she sends Jacob far away. No one knows where he's going except for, for Rebecca. And they live separate lives for decades. Finally, We come to the point where Jacob, now living in a foreign land, has decided he wants to return to his homeland. And so that's what happens. And he comes home with all this blessing, bountiful blessing. Now look at verse 4 of chapter 33. And then Esau ran to meet him. So now Jacob, with with his entire entourage, has now traveled to return to their homeland. And this is what happens. And then verse 4. And then Esau ran to meet him, embraced him. This is the brother that wanted to kill him. There's a moment right here. And if this moment is not handled properly... It will not go well. Esau ran to meet him, embraced him, threw his arms around his neck, and he kissed him. These are twins. They both wept. And then Esau looked at all of the women and the children, and he asked, who are all of these people? (laughs) Jacob's got this nation with him. Who are all of these people? These are the children that God has graciously given to me. Verse 8. And all the flocks and, and all the herds that I met as I came, you know, it's like, okay, I came out here to meet you. And there's like all these flocks and herds. And Jacob replied, they're a gift, my Lord, to ensure our friendship. Friendship? Friendship? That, no, 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 no. These are siblings. 
Jacob doesn't even get it. He doesn't even get it. This is his brother. And I want to ensure our friendship. And then Esau says, my brother, I have plenty, Esau answered. Keep what you have for yourself. This is a moment in time that if not handled properly, will not end well. There are times, my friends, when someone seeks your forgiveness. There are times when someone comes to you. If those moments are not handled properly in that moment, it will not end well. My brother, I have plenty, Esau answered. Keep what you have for yourself. And Jacob insisted, no, 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 no. If I have found favor with you, please accept this gift from me. It's kind of like a bribe, you know? I, I, I want to make sure that you're not going to kill me, is what he's saying. Because his heart was not in the same place that in this moment, Esau's heart was in the right place in this moment. In this moment in time that if not handled properly will not end well. The moment in time was not handled properly. It did not end well. Esau offered the forgiveness. No, if I've found favor with you, please accept my gift. What a relief to see your friendly smile it's like seeing the face of God a moment in time. If not handled properly, it will not end well. It would have been great if the story could have ended just then. That, that they, 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 they hug, they cry, they both receive this forgiveness. One is saying, here's my gift to show you that I, I, I am sorry for what I did, but never said that. And the other one says, I don't, I don't need that. I, I, I'm just thankful that you're back, brother. But then, this moment in time, it wasn't handled properly. It did not end well. And Jacob says, you know what? We've got all these little kids. We've got all this livestock. You know, we, we travel slow. So you go on back home. It'll take us a couple days to get there because, you know, we travel slow. So you go on home and we'll, we'll join you soon. It was yet another lie. The forgiveness was offered, but he just wasn't sure about receiving it. And in so, so instead of just being rivals, now hatred is going to begin to grow again between the two. Jacob moves another direction, takes his nation, so to speak, and they go a separate way, parting one from another. A moment in time that was not handled properly. Esau offered forgiveness. But when it was not accepted, and when he found out that yet again his brother had lied to him, that hatred, that jealousy, it reared its ugly head. And there it was again. And these two nations, to this very Day, my friends. Esau, the Edomites, they currently live in the southern western part of Jordan. These two nations are still at war today. They are not rivals, they are at war. We don't realize sometimes how important moments in time can be, especially a moment in time that's connected to forgiveness. And when we look at God and the forgiveness that he offers us as his people, what we must realize is that God does not forgive the way we forgive. God does not deceive us. He does not trick us. He does not lie to us. When he says, I will forgive you, he means he will forgive us absolutely and completely. Jacob had he received that forgiveness and let go of his own sin, things would have been different. Are we letting go of the sin that we are offering to God? Or are we acting like Jacob, 
saying we are sorry, asking for forgiveness, but then holding on to our sin in such a way that this moment in time that we have to surrender that to the Lord, this moment in time is not handled properly. But the thing about God is he will keep giving you moments in time. But if you turn from that, there is destruction. There is hatred. There is animosity. There is bitterness. What are you doing with the moment in time when the Lord is saying, receive my forgiveness completely. Let go of your past. Don't keep dragging it around like a bag of dirty garbage. Oh, God's forgiven me, but I got to keep dragging around this trash. All my sin, I got to keep hanging on to it. Let go. Receive his forgiveness. Learn. Learn about the important moment in time where we surrender and receive forgiveness. Forgiveness is a two-way street. It's not just about being forgiven. It's about offering forgiveness. What the Lord does for us, we now are called to do for others. In this moment in time, what are we going to do? Have we truly received God's forgiveness? This week, I want you to take your seat reminder. It says just that. I want you thinking through what can happen when we will not offer forgiveness or receive forgiveness. I want you talking to the Lord this week. I want you to have that moment in time that ends well because you are walking in God's favor. Amen? Amen? Stand with me and let's pray. Father God, humbly we bow before your throne of mercy and grace. And Lord God, you are a God who loves us so. You've given us everything we need to be in a relationship with you. And so, Father, we just quiet ourselves for a moment. We just seek to recognize whether we have truly received your forgiveness Maybe today is the day that someone either in this room or watching online needs to receive the forgiveness of Jesus Christ. And so we're going to respect one another. We're going to close our eyes. We're going to bow our heads. If there's someone in this room who today, that's what you need. You need the forgiveness of Christ. Would you slip your hand in the air so I can see your hand? I see those hands. Oh, yes. Young person, I see your hand. I see your hand. I see yours also and yours. Amen. Amen.